This series of images began as a casual couple of pencil drawings created while walking around the town where I've lived for more than 10 years. I soon became very aware that not until I stopped and really looked did I realise how very many things I had walked right past without noticing them at all, or if I did so, not consciously registering any detail. Therefore I have created this collection of pictures of Falmouth and included some of the town's history. I hope you enjoy this walk around Falmouth. Our tour of Falmouth begins at the Observatory Tower. This building is situated just off of Western Terrace. The observatory was constructed in 1868. It occupies the highest point in town and offers a 360 degree panoramic view over Falmouth. At the point where Western Terrace meets Dracena Avenue, Killigrew Street leads down to the town centre. Where these three roads meet is All Saints Church. The land to build this church was donated by Lord Kimberley in 1887. Mr T. Day Seddon was appointed to be the architect and the foundation stone was laid by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Construction of the church is of the Old English style and was completed at the cost of less than £5,000. The Bishop of Barbados consecrated All Saints Church in 1890, following down the steep hill of Killigrew Street and heading north-northeast. On the left-hand side of the street is located the magnificent structure of the Roman Catholic Church of St Mary Immaculate. The original church was built by J. A. Hansen in 1868. The tower and spire were added in 1881. The overall design is of a splendid blend of Gothic and Burgundian Romanesque. At the bottom of Killigrew Street's hill resides the Maritime Monument that was erected in 1898. The intention of this structure is to honour Falmouth's history of hosting the packet ship service from 1688 until 1850. It was via one of these packet ships that the news of our victory at the Battle of Trafalgar and the death of Lord Nelson first reached the shores of England. Passing the Maritime Monument, we come to the moor. This is a focal point of Falmouth. This area is surrounded by a historical architecture that dates back to the 1700s. These buildings include the original Town Hall and Magistrates Court, post office, art gallery and library. Today the moor hosts a number of market stores and a regular farmers market. On the east side of the moor is a narrow and steep set of stone steps that number 111 in total. They lead from the moor up to Wellington Terrace. This challenging climb was constructed in 1791 by Jacob Hamley. At the foot of Jacob's ladder is the dominating structure of the Methodist Church. Originally built in 1791 as a Wesley Chapel, the building as it looks today was built in 1876. Sadly, the church was bombed not once but twice during World War II, but was successfully reconstructed in 1956. This building is no longer a Royal Mail post office, however, post office it once was. It was constructed in 1930 on the site that was once the town's old market. The architectural influence is more in the French style and is quite different to the design of neighbouring buildings. Adjacent to the post office building remains the roofed fountain that once stood inside the old market. Falmouth Art Gallery and Library This most imposing building was constructed in 1896 for the purpose of housing the town's first library. It was funded by John Passmore Edwards and Octavius Allen Ferris. The architect was W.H. Jessidia. The structure features Plymouth limestone with Cornish granite dressings. Overlooking the market square is the Old Town Hall. This building was presented to the town in 1725 by Martin Lister Killigrew. It also housed Falmer's first magistrate's court, St George's Arcade. This in 1912 housed Falmer's first cinema. It was then the second largest moving picture house in the UK. It is now a thriving shopping mall. It also is the entrance to the infamous Club International. In the 1950s, the club was then named the Penn Dennis Club, a venue where often played Mr. Roy Kenton and his famous big swing band. The Church of King Charles the Martyr. After the civil war between the Royalists and the Roundheads, 1642 to 1646, and the execution of King Charles I, 
the king's son Charles II came to the throne in 1658. During the troubled times, the soon-to-be king had once taken refuge in Falmouth while en route to his escape across the Channel. After his triumphant return and coronation, he funded the building of a church in Falmouth. The church is named in memory of the executed king, his predecessor. The land that the church is built on was donated by the Killigrew family, who had supported the royalists during the war years. King Charles Church was completed and consecrated in 1662. The Old Art School, built in 1902. This building was the very first art school to open in Falmouth. It was then a private school where for a fee of four to ten shillings per session, students could learn the skills of drawing and painting. In 1938, the school became under the umbrella of the local education authority. During the 1950s, the art college relocated to Kerasfeen, Wood Lane. From humble beginnings, the original art school has become a modern university that accommodates thousands of students that study arts, performance and media. This avenue is most probably the first walkway to be formed in Falmouth. It once led to Iwenic Manor, the home of the Killigrew family. From 1737, the walk was used for the twisting of hempen to form the ropes and rigging for ships docked in the harbour. Many of the majestic trees that once lined Arwenic Avenue, also known as Rope Walk, were sadly lost to Dutch elm disease during the 1970s. But the former glory of the floor that lined the walk has now been restored. Looking westward from the harbour, clearly can be seen at the top of the skyline, the observatory tower. Lower down, at the edge of the waterfront on Customs Quay, sits the Customs House, the Quayside Public House and the Chain Locker Public House. The public quay resides within a small basin that is protected by three sea walls with a narrow entrance. This offers shelter for dinghies and small vessels. Customs House Quay Built back in 1670, this quayside has witnessed the almost entire history of Falmouth and the town's rich maritime past. From its humble beginning of hosting a small number of fishing boats to becoming a packet ship station. Falmouth became the only port of communication to the British Empire. The port, because of the great depth of its harbour, became vital to the maritime efforts of World War II. The quay now provides a landing point for small vessels and skiffs, transporting sailors from ocean-going vessels that are anchored or moored in the harbour. The King or Queen's Pipe Cornwall has a long-standing history of fishing, tin mining, an ocean-going commerce, but it is no secret that smuggling has always also thrived along the Cornish coastline. During the 18th and early 19th century, tobacco was often smuggled ashore at Falmouth. When the Customs Authority was successful in intercepting this illegal contraband, what was confiscated was burned in this red brick chimney that still remains on the corner of Customs House Quay. Built in 1814, the Customs House remains an architectural presence that represents authority and law. The Doric columns that front onto Arwenic Street symbolise power and strength. During the 19th century, a new and much larger dock was constructed close to the mouth of the River Fowl. By 1858, many big ships were visiting the harbour. Smuggling became widespread and the Port's Customs Authority became diligent in their task to intercept illegal importation. This same situation remains today. Designed by architects Long and Kentish, the National Maritime Museum was built at the beginning of the new millennium. The museum is situated in Founts Event Square. In the museum's short history, the square has played host to a number of significant maritime celebrations including the landing of Ellen MacArthur after her circumnavigation of the world. Event Square also hosts many Cornish social events, such as Falmouth's Oyster Festival and the Cornish Sea Shanty Festival. Grove Place This road, so named due to the fact that in the days when the Killigrew family occupied Arwenic Manor, it was blessed with a magnificent grove of elm trees. Grove Place today, to the north-northwest, leads into the centre of town, and to the south east east onto the road entrance to Falmouth Docks. It also is the third resting place of the Killigrew Monument or Pyramid, first erected in 1737. Arwenic Manor was originally built in 1385 
and was acquired by the Kilgu family in 1403. It was mostly rebuilt by Sir John Kilgu, the first governor of Pendennis Castle, in 1571. The monument that occupies the position opposite Arwenic Manor was originally erected on behalf of Martin Lister Kilgu in 1737. Three times this structure has been moved. It now occupies a space 100 metres from its original position. Today, Falmouth welcomes and plays host not only to huge ocean-going vessels, but also to a myriad of smaller craft from every corner of the world. In her rich history, the port has accommodated renowned seafarers such as Charles Darwin, who arrived in Falmouth after spending five years circumnavigating the globe. The harbour is as always a popular destination for traditional classic boats that retain their love of wind and sail. Falmouth boasts to be the third deepest natural harbour in the world and is the first deep water port for vessels entering the English Channel. Therefore, the docks at Port Pendennis are a popular venue for large commercial vessels, cruise ships, super yachts and naval ships. This is a Tudor-built blockhouse that is situated close to sea level at Pendennis Point. Little Dennis is small in size compared to the main castle that sits on the top of the steep hill that forms the southerly point of the entrance of Falmouth Harbour. Pendennis Castle sits high above Pendennis Point, from where the view extends from the most southerly tip of the Cornish coastline around to the mouth of the River Fowl. Henry VIII commissioned the building of Pendennis Castle to protect the Carrick Roads from invasion. The castle dates back to 1545. In 1863, the railway came to Falmouth. Three individual stations were built. This transport connection, coupled with the port's maritime trade routes, facilitated a hub of commerce and vastly added to Falmouth's commercial success. It also opened up the opportunities of tourism. The first building constructed for this sole purpose was built adjacent to Castle Beach. The Falmouth Hotel, as it is still known, was built in 1865. The pavilions were named after Princess Alexandra of Tech, who opened them in 1911. To the rear of the main building resides the Winter Gardens, where can be found the cast iron bandstand built by W.H. Jesidia. In those days, the cost of admission for visitors was one penny, free on Sundays, 2 to 5.30 p.m., and Sunday mornings during July, August and September. Today, the Princess Pavilions is a popular venue for musicians, bands and comedy acts. It also annually hosts the graduation ceremonies of Falmouth University. Adjacent to the gardens of the pavilions are Gilling Dune Gardens. This steep area is occupied by a number of magnificent high spruce trees. Among these majestic trees is a perfect place to look out over the Atlantic Ocean. During the 1800s, this land was a part of a privately owned estate and then belonged to the Coop family. Today, Gillingdoon Gardens offer free public access and form a pedestrian link between Cliff Road and Melville Road. Coop's Folly Although never being consecrated, this intriguing building is often referred to as the chapel. Adjacent to this structure is a stone spiral staircase that descends down to what has become to be known as Tunnel Beach. It is thought that the Reverend W. J. Coop sat and wrote his sermons in the folly and the Coop family used the tunnel as access to their own private beach. By the beginning of the 20th century, Falmouth had become a popular tourist destination and several hotels had already been built along Cliff Road. At the western end of the road is located Gillingvays Beach. Today this beach remains a popular haunt for visitors and locals alike. The gently sloping sandy beach offers an ideal location for swimmers. On occasion dolphins or basking sharks can be spotted close to the shoreline here. The beach at Gilly, as it is fondly referred to by the locals, meets with Queen Mary Gardens. These beautiful and immaculately kept gardens were constructed in 1907 to commemorate the coronation of Mary, wife of George V.